Hi guys, Olive here, here today to talk about what I read in December 2023. I know we've all officially moved on to 2024 at this point, but I wanted to take a moment and give December its due. I read some really good books in December. There was an impromptu reread, some favorites of the year crept in at the very last minute. I was also hard at work trying to finish off my 23 nonfiction books to read in 2023 list. So let's get into how all that went at the very end of the year, starting off with fiction. I'll begin by talking about that reread I just mentioned. I decided to reread Bridget Jones's Diary by Helen Fielding. It seems to happen to me like clockwork every other year that I hardcore crave this book around Christmas time. And that's what started happening to me again in early December. So I decided to put on the audiobook for this one while I did a puzzle. And let me tell you, it was exactly what I needed. In case you somehow don't know anything about this book, then I will tell you it's it's a loose retelling of Pride and Prejudice, except in this book, Lizzie Bennett is Bridget Jones. She is a neurotic 30-something who works in publishing. Mr. Wickham in this book is actually Bridget's boss, who she gets involved with at several different points throughout this book. And then Mr. Darcy in this universe is also named Mr. Darcy, and he's pretty much the same character, except here he is an upright barrister who is the son of friends of the family. Things play out kind of similarly to Pride and Prejudice in this book. Like if you go in knowing it's a loose retelling of Pride and Prejudice, then you'll see the similarities. But there are a lot of differences as well. This one takes place in the 1990s. So there's a lot more smoking, drinking, and body image issues than you will find in Jane Austen's classic. Bridget Jones is an absolute mess at times, but she is so lovable. It's impossible not to root for her. You want the best for her, even as she's making a total hash of things. There was a moment during this year's reread, though, that I realized that I'm either around the same age or probably even the exact same age that Bridget was in this first novel in the series. There are others, if you are aware of this series. And that was a little bit strange. It definitely brings a weird new aspect to my semi-annual rereads of this book. Next time I pick this book up, I will be older than Bridget Jones. <laughs> when I saw the movie, the movie adaptation of this book back when I was a teenager. So it's kind of weird that I've had that arc with this book. But regardless, this is always a silly, feel good, fun experience. Exactly what I wanted. After finishing Bridget Jones, I was in the mood to read another lighter book. I knew I had some very heavy reading ahead of me for the rest of December. So I wanted to to start off the month on a light note. And as I mentioned in my January TBR, I have been watching a ton of women's college basketball lately. And I have been on the prowl for any books that even mention the women's game. And I found one. It's a romance book called Love Game by Maggie Wells. This book stars two rival college coaches. There is the established women's basketball coach. She has made her team very successful. She's a former professional player herself. And then there's the incoming men's football coach. He is coming into this school off the back of a scandal at his previous school, and he's being tasked with improving the school's struggling team. This book is sort of a hate to love type romance, where the characters start off disliking one another and then a romance develops over time. Those are actually my favorite types of romances. But it felt a little bit forced in this one because it didn't seem like there was a lot of natural conflict between the two main characters. The only point of contention between them is that the women's basketball coach is concerned that the school bringing in this new highly paid men's coach is going to have an impact on her upcoming contract negotiations, which will hopefully involve a raise. And I think she has every right to be concerned about that. But beyond that, there's no other conflict between the two characters. So again, that didn't feel very natural. I did, however, really enjoy that both of the characters read extremely authentically as jocks. They are competitive. Their minds in the game. I just I just wish we would have been able to see both of them at work as coaches more. We get to see a little bit with the men's football coach, but this book takes place during the off season for the women's college game. And so I didn't get exactly what I came for. I'll say that much. And then the final quarter or so of this book 
it devolves into just a mess of logistics, which is not fun for me. I come to books to escape logistics, which seem to dominate so much of my life. So this was decent. There were things to like in here, but it wasn't all that memorable. And I don't really feel inspired to keep going with the series. But it's a pretty good thing I had two fluffier books under my belt before I attempted to take on Faust by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, a tragic play about a man in search of true fulfillment who makes a deal with the devil to try to get it. Part one of this was shocking. Part two, I feel like I barely understood. I read this for my Wishbone series, and this is definitely one of the works that Wishbone covered that I know I would have never picked up just of my own volition. I picked this up because of my coverage of the series. And I can't exactly say that I'm glad that I read this. I was not enjoying it while I read it, but I am glad that it's now under my belt. So if I ever hear this book, this story referenced at some point in the future, I'll have an understanding of what people are talking about. God forbid I ever make it to Jeopardy. I was probably going to have to read this anyway to study for Jeopardy. But this is a lot. It's really intense. And it just makes it all the more shocking that the writers of Wishbone chose this to adapt adapt for a kid's show. They definitely had to figuratively sand down the edges of this one to make it even semi-appropriate for children. It definitely wasn't the best choice, in my opinion, but if you would like to see how they did it, I will link my latest episode of What's the Story Wishbone for you in the description box and up in the cards. I also picked up another work of fiction that was on the darker side. It's called Let the Dead Bury the Dead by Alison Epstein. This is a work of historical fiction or probably more alternative history because it's set in an alternative version of Imperial Russia. And in this story, a mystical woman bewitches not only the second son of the czar, but also a woman involved in the revolution. I don't have a lot more to say about this one beyond that, because this one just didn't have a lot of plot beyond what I've already said. And also, I just didn't like it. That's really the long and short of it. I don't feel like we got any backstory about how this mystical woman is getting people to do her bidding, how she's winning them over, making them change their entire personalities, turn their backs on people that they care about. It just happens in the blank of an eye. It's not even a process. So that was pretty boring. I should know better by this point to pick up historical fiction written by people who don't have a strong background in studying Russia. Because when I go into any work of historical fiction set in Russia, I'm looking for that Russia feeling. And I think only people who have a pretty good understanding of the country can give me that. Like, I think the best one that I can remember in recent memory that I've read in recent years is is the Bear and the Nightingale. And that's because Catherine Arden studied at Middlebury and she lived in Moscow for a while. The last novel I read in December, though, I did like. In fact, I liked it so much that it became a favorite novel of 2023. It's called The Love Scribe by Amy Meyerson. This book is about a woman named Alice who discovers completely by accident that the short stories she writes for people have the ability to make that person, the reader of the short story, fall in love immediately after they're done reading the short story. But she comes to find out that her gift doesn't come without conditions. In fact, many conditions apply when it comes to how that love is going to turn out in the end. There are some novels that I read that I feel comfortable recommending to just about anyone. Like I think nearly anyone would enjoy them. And that's not how I feel about this book. I don't think this is a book that necessarily everyone would love, but I know why I loved it. This book is messy, but it's messy in the way that life is messy. Throughout this book, Alice has to confront her own view of love, but she also has to confront this image of her father that she's been harboring since his death when she was an adolescent. This book is very complex, and I don't think the twists and turns that it takes are going to be to everyone's taste. And by looking at the Goodreads reviews, that has definitely been the case so far, but I adored this. If you missed me talking about it in my Top Fiction Books of the Year video, I'll link that for you in the description box and up in the cards. Then there was one nonfiction book I read very late in the year that was a late addition to my top nonfiction books of the year list. It's Voices from Chernobyl by Svetlana Alexeyevich, an oral history of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster as told by people who lived through it. 
They're talking about their memories of that time and the people they lost. I think what surprised me most as I was reading this book is that several different people that Svetlana Alexeyevich interviewed to be in this book referred to this situation as a war, which looking in from the outside, knowing just what happened in the Chernobyl nuclear disaster, I don't think anyone on the outside would think to call it that. But I can understand where they were coming from, how they felt that way, except it was probably the most confusing war that anyone could ever imagine because the enemy isn't an army. It's not the other side. The enemy is something invisible. The enemy is radiation that's scattered unequally around the land at any given point, and what that silently does to the human body. These people had no idea. They did not know that the mighty atom that had been advertised to them as something only positive, they didn't know it could turn on them and make them sick. And the stories of what people went through, what the human body goes through when exposed to the highest levels of radiation... It's enough to make me sick just thinking about it right now. Reading this book, it's really hard to believe that this stuff actually happened. Like, it feels unreal. It feels straight out of a horror movie. And the whole book is like that. I think something that hadn't really solidified in my mind before I read this is that the people who went through this, they're the same people who had just made it through World War II and through Stalin's purges, and then this happens? Knowing that, you can't even blame the older people who wanted to return to their homes. Even if objectively you know, that's a terrible idea, there's radiation there, don't do that. But you can't even blame them. And then the way the government handled it, lying through their teeth about it, which I understand at first was meant to prevent panic, like I understand lying about it for a short period of time. But then they continued being dishonest about the danger, which is par for the course for the Soviets. This was just devastating to read. I'm going to try really hard not to get emotional right now. I love Svetlana Alexeyevich. Secondhand Time was brilliant, and I absolutely want to read her other oral histories. It's some of the most important reading I've ever done, but I feel like I need to put at least a couple of years in between my reads of her books because they just rip my heart out of my chest, especially because I have a background in studying this area these books do a lot to me. Like it hits especially hard because I know more than just what this book is saying. So this was incredible, but it's going to take me a little while to recover from this. But then I picked up another hard read for my 23 nonfiction books to read in 2023 list. I wasn't kidding when I said I had some pretty dark reading ahead of me during the month of December, but I read Nothing to Envy by Barbara Demick, which is a collection of stories of people who defected from North Korea and thus were able to relay their stories of what it was like to live there in the 1990s. Their actions were monitored and tightly controlled. Food was extremely scarce. If any member of your family was deemed undesirable in any way, it would absolutely go on to have an impact on your life. So much of this rang familiar because, like I said, I've studied the Soviet Union, but so much about this was so much worse, largely because of the food situation. It was kind of like if the siege of Leningrad wasn't an event, but a country. It probably goes without saying, but this was also extremely heartbreaking to read. What I think is going to stay with me most from this book, though, isn't necessarily all the stories of what it was like to live in North Korea, because I did know a little bit about that from studying in school. But something I didn't know was just how much trouble these North Korean defectors had in assimilating to life in South Korea. Life is so different there, they might as well have been on another planet. Like they were tempted almost to go back to North Korea because at least then that would have been familiar. They wouldn't have felt so out of place. This is just another unbelievable story. It didn't quite make my top nonfiction books of the year list. I had a very strong list this year. But I think if I would have made an honorable mentions list, this probably would have been on it. Just very, very well done. The next book I ticked off that nonfiction list was Hidden Figures by Margot Lee Shetterly, the history of a group of Black women who worked as computers, which used to be the name of a job rather than the name of a machine. They worked as computers for the United States government and provided a essential calculations for the space race. Lots of Soviet references in this video, as it turns out. I really expected to love this. It is so popular, so widely read. It's been made into a movie, which I still need to see. But honestly, I found this one to be a bit of a slog, largely because of the writing. 
It's very stilted, very choppy. There's so much focus on the day in, day out lives of the women, which I found to be a little bit dull. And then I feel like we didn't get enough of their personalities, their individual personalities, to be able to tell them apart. So sometimes I was confused about who I was even hearing about. There were moments in this book where I felt invested in the story, that I felt like her storytelling skills were on point. But most of the time, I was just trying to get through this book so I could move on to something else. Another book I read off of that priority nonfiction list is The Gulf by Jack E. Davis, which is an extremely thorough history of the Gulf or the Gulf of Mexico. If you're not American, we tend to just call it the Gulf or the Gulf Coast. So we start off with a history of the settlement of this region, and then we move into topics that have to do with the Gulf, things like nature, oil, hurricanes, specific information relating to the states that are on the Gulf Coast. This book is just really well done. I, of course, loved all the sections that had to do with nature because I love reading about nature. There was a lot of bird talk in here, which was amazing. But also there was a lot of talk about manatees, which I don't think I've ever talked about it on this channel before. But as a child, I was obsessed with manatees. They were my favorite animal, could not learn enough about manatees. So my inner manatee obsessed child was made very happy by this book. But what also made me happy is all the other books I've read that this book brought to mind. Like fairly recently, I read a whole book on hurricanes. It was called A Furious Sky. And then just during nonfiction November, I read a book on Havana. And this book talked a little bit about both of those topics. So I like that there were those callbacks as well. This is just a really good book. If you are interested in the topic, you might want to check this one out. Just just be prepared because it's very long. Now, I will admit to you that there was one book, one solitary book on that 23 nonfiction books to read in 2023 list that I did not end up finishing. And that's because I made the decision to DNF Dark Skies by Tiffany Francis. I had to put it down because it just wasn't the discussion of the human relationship with nighttime in the night sky that I thought it was when I put it on that priority list in the first place. Instead, this is much more about the author's travels. We get little bits of what I thought this book was, but inside of those conversations about her travels and things she was thinking about as she looked up at the night sky. This is just way more of a quiet, introspective book than I was in the mood for. And again, it was so different than what I was expecting. It was the end of the year. I wasn't in the mood to push myself to read something that I wasn't invested in. So I just decided to take the L. And I had started to catch on to the fact that I really wasn't in the mood to read that type of book because I had just finished The Comfort of Crows by Margaret Rankel. This is a collection of very short essays about things that the author observed in her own backyard over the course of a calendar year. And listen, I think Margaret Rankel is amazing. I love her writing. It's beautiful. But the fact that this book lacked a central focus in the way that her other two books didn't, and the fact that I am just really not in the mood to read these quiet, reflective books that are centered around the natural world right now, it didn't really agree with me. I think I'm in this headspace because this is the absolute worst time of year to live in Pittsburgh. December through February are not good months to be a Pittsburgher. We are always a very gray, very cloudy, overcast city, but this time of year is especially gray. And I feel like this winter has been extremely gray. And so I just don't want to read about the natural world while it's like that outside. I'm just not in the headspace for it. So I think I'm going to try to revisit this at a time when I'm feeling less grumpy. But another book I thought I was going to love a little bit more than I ended up doing was Dolls of Our Lives by Alison Horrocks and Mary Mahoney, which is a history of the American Girl doll, how it came to be, the story behind all of the dolls, how they grew in popularity, then the offshoots like all of the books and the magazine. They talk about where missteps happened, where the brand could have gone further in representing American girls. It's an interesting history. It was written by two co-hosts of a podcast all about American girl dolls. The two hosts were fans growing up, and then they've gone back into American Girl Doll and all of the lore behind it as adults. And because they run that podcast. This book leans toward the conversational in ways that sometimes works, and then other times it really doesn't. 
I personally found that there were far too many casual pop culture references. It really disrupted the flow of the history. But I'll close out this wrap up with one that I did really enjoy. It's the final book I read off of that 23 nonfiction books list. It's called Complications by Atul Gawande. This author is a surgeon. He's written several different books about being a surgeon. But this one is all about things that can go wrong or ethical dilemmas. So in this book, he talks about things like how surgeons need to practice their skills in order to get better, to become good surgeons. They have to practice these techniques, but no one wants to be practiced on in a medical sense, which creates a really big issue because these surgeons need to practice. And so he talks about that issue and how they work around it. He talks about whether certain surgeries are even ethical to perform. There's a whole topic of weight loss surgery, gastric bypass surgery in this book, which I would love to hear his updated thoughts on because it has become way more common since he wrote this. But then he also talks about things like the power of a surgeon's intuition and how it can outsmart computers at some points. Just a lot of different topics in this book. This definitely wasn't as life-changing as Being Mortal, which is one of my all-time favorite nonfiction books, but there was so much interesting food for thought in this book, so many interesting things to chew on. I'm going to be thinking about this one for a long time to come. This is probably another one I'm going to revisit at some point. So those were all the books I read during the month of December. I was definitely a very busy bee trying to polish off all of those nonfiction books from my list. I know I DNF'd one, but I still consider the whole thing to be a success. I got to read some books, experience some books that are very popular that I hadn't read yet. It introduced me to some great new authors and a couple of favorites for this year. And for that, I'm very grateful. Finishing off 2023's list just makes me all the more excited to move on to my list for 2024. But that's it for this video. All the books that I spoke about today will be listed and linked for you in the description box below. They will be there along with links to any of my other videos that I may have mentioned throughout this one. Everything's down there for your clicking convenience. And at the bottom of the exact same description box, you'll also see links to everywhere you can find me around the internet. Goodreads, Instagram, the story graph, all the places I'm the most active in case you want to keep up with what I'm reading and doing right now. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you're having a wonderful day. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.